Okay. Uh, thanks everyone for joining and welcome back. I see a lot of new people this time, but all people are gone. I assume they are taking advantage of uh, warm temperature this week for harvesting. But we have so far 26, 27 people, which is good. Uh, so today's seminar or today's speaker is Dr. John Pleasant. He's a professor in Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology. He has been here in ISU for the past 40 years. Uh, he, he received his bachelor from University of Notre Dame in biology, and then his PhD in ecology from University of California, Los Angeles. He has very wide or diverse background in research. He has been, work, he has been working with bumblebees, um, that are the pollinators in Colorado Rockies. He has been working with flowering patterns in compass plant. He has worked in uh, edge structure of relic white pine populations. And then most importantly here in monarch butterflies. So at ISU, he also teaches courses in general biology and environmental biology. Uh, and he, do a seminar on ethical eating. So today he's going to talk about agriculture and monarchs. So I welcome Dr. Pleasant and please, uh, Dr. Pleasant, you can have a uh, start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm going to share my screen. All right, you should see some slides there, I think. Uh, okay, so um, so I'm going to talk about uh, an uneasy relationship between agriculture and monarchs, and we'll we'll start uh, way back uh, for there was agriculture, at least modern agriculture. I, I should preface that by saying that you know the, the Native Americans you, you just referred to, in fact, did agriculture uh, in in this same area. And so they had some effect too, but we'll talk about more about uh, quote, modern agriculture or agriculture practiced by, by Europeans. So we'll talk, we'll start with plowing up the prairie and what that had to, the significance for monarchs for that. And then we'll, we'll talk about some more recent uh, things that have happened in agriculture that, that have had some influence on monarch butterflies, uh, introduction of BT corn, uh, Roundup Ready corn and soybeans, and then more recently, uh, neonics. So, let's see. Uh, I thought I had this slide thing worked out. Mm. Was, there we go. All right. So, um, we need just to put this whole thing in context, we need to talk about the, the monarch annual cycle. So uh, right now, if, if some of you are outside doing uh, field research, you should be seeing monarchs flying by. Uh, they're on their way to Mexico. I was just out this morning, in fact, watching some, some of them flying to Mexico. And so they've, they've come from this general area here. This is the summer breeding grounds, the Midwest, the Northeast, and they're heading down to a place near Mexico City at about 10,000 feet where they'll be uh, spending the winter in about in the Oyamel fir forests. And then around February, March, they'll come back uh, north and uh, stop here mostly in the Texas area and Oklahoma, and they'll have a generation. And then the offspring from that generation will move up here somewhere around middle to late May and populate this whole breeding zone and they'll stay there all summer. There, there may be two, possibly three generations and then the individuals from the last generation will start the, the process all over again. So um, migrating through now will arrive in Mexico around the, the Day of the Dead, around November 1st. Um, and um, Interestingly enough, there was a lot of interest in where the monarchs were going. So the people in the United States saw these monarchs 
flying by, going southwest. And then once they got past the U.S. border, they didn't know what the heck happened to them. And so there were people tagging butterflies to try to figure out where they went. It wasn't really till 1975 that the overwintering colonies for the monarch butterfly were, were discovered, at least by um, people in the United States. The people in Mexico knew about these things. In fact, they had festivals and still do have festivals um, having to do with the monarchs coming back and uh, their dead ancestors coming back and, and so on. So, but it wasn't until 75, the people in Mexico didn't know where these butterflies came from and the people in the United States didn't know where the butterflies went. But finally those two pieces of information came together and we, we realized where, where these guys were going. And so once they get to, to Mexico, they will uh, overwinter in these uh, big colonies. You can see them just packed in along tree trunks and on branches of trees. Here's an aerial view. You can see there's the forests are kind of orange with all the monarchs that are there. Um, and since, uh, since 1994, um, groups of people have been measuring the size of the overwintering colony. So this is actually a, a way to measure the size of a population. It's really pretty unique. I mean, if you think about what the U.S. is doing now for our census, you know, we have to go to every, every individual, every house and get some information on how many are there. Here, all the monarchs go to one place basically to be counted. So um, we ac obviously can't count every individual. It's, they're just way too many of them, as you saw in that picture. So what, what we do is we measure the, the size of the area with trees that are occupied by monarch butterflies. So we measure that, measure that in hectares, which is a little over two, take two acres, 2.5 acres. So started doing that in 1994 and have done that uh, every year since. And um, one of the things that people began noticing in around 2004, five, six, and so on was that the numbers seem to be going down. And um, in, 2013, they, they hit the lowest point in, in this whole uh, time frame. So 0 0.67 hectares, so to put that in, in context, that's about a football field and a little more. So you imagine all the butterflies from North America coming down to a, an area that's about the size of a football field, which is, which is pretty small and um, some real concerns were raised about the, the vulnerability of this population and whether it had gotten so small that it wouldn't persist anymore. It did, did in fact come back and it's been, been going ever since. But one of the concerns is that um, there can be winter storms in these overwintering uh, colonies and there've been three or four over the last couple of decades Here's, this was a major one in January of 2002. This guy's, I think he's, at, at first I think he was standing in, in dead butterflies, but he's kneeling in dead butterflies. But that still gives you some idea of, of how many butterflies were dead lying on the ground after the storm. Here he is putting his, his hand into a, a mass of dead butterflies. So 75% of the population was killed in this winter storm. We, we don't know exactly how many butterflies there are per hectare, but we've made some estimates that there may be about 20, 20 million or so. So um, in this particular mortality event, uh, maybe 500 million butterflies might have died. So we can imagine if the population gets down to 0 0.67 hectares and what if one of these winter storms hit, uh, there could be some real concern. So actually it was in 2014, because of this very low population size and concerns about whether this whole migration thing could persist, there was a petition to list the monarch butterfly as, as an endangered species. In fact, that's gone through all the various channels and December, in December of this year, there will be a determination made by the Fish and Wildlife Service about whether the monarch butterfly will be listed as an endangered or threatened species. So um, we'll talk a little bit about why that population decline has occurred. Um, but one thing we, we need to, to point out, and this will 
um, tell us a little bit about what's going on with this population. So you can use stable isotopes to tell where a butterfly grew up. So a butterfly, a monarch butterfly feeds on milkweed plants. That's its host plant, that's all it can feed on. And the tissues in the plant that it feeds on have certain, certain stable isotope ratios, which then are carried to the butterfly itself. And so if you go down to Mexico and you collect a bunch of butterflies, you can figure out where they came from. And most of the butterflies that you find in Mexico came from this area that we would, we would tend to call the Midwest. Now, as we all know, uh, the Midwest is also the area where uh, there's major soybean production and major corn production. So clearly agriculture and monarch butterflies are uh, operating cheek by jowl, if you will. So let's go back in time. Let's start with the first sort of thing I'm going to talk about, which is uh, what about the monarch population before agriculture? So we were here in Iowa, uh, early 1800s. Um, we would have seen prairie. Um, there would have been different kinds of prairie. There would have been sort of tall grass prairie, more maybe mid grass prairie, wetter prairies, drier prairies, sw swampy areas, and so on. But most of it was prairie, except for um, riverways and so on that had uh, riparian or, or trees. So we had the prairie. And the question is, well, what, what was the monarch population doing at this time? Well, we obviously didn't have any count of the size of the population at this time. Um, but there are some historical references to um, the monarch butterflies in, in the 1800s. Here's, here's one qu quote from somebody who described uh, vast numbers so as to darken the sky by the clouds of them. So this is clearly during uh, a migration period uh, when they can be streaming in large numbers. And people have also noticed uh, roost trees. So one of the things that monarch butterflies do during migration is they will stop for the night and congregate together in a tree uh, by, by the hundreds, perhaps. And those things are pretty noticeable. So there are historical records from the 1800s of people noticing very, very large roost trees. So we know the butterflies were, were here on the prairies. Uh, we don't really have any idea how big the population was. And um, the milkweeds that were in, in prairies, let's say in, in Iowa, uh, would have been pretty diverse. So here's some of the different possible milkweed species that you might have seen um, in Iowa. Um, some of the more common ones would be the swamp milkweed and butterfly weed. Um, and of course, common milkweed is the one we see most today. So we don't know how big the population was uh, way back before agriculture, but we can ask the question, well, what was the, what was the milkweed support capacity for monarchs back then compared to now? So how much milkweed was there on the landscape? And that maybe can give us some idea of how big a population could have been supported. So um, to do that, we can, we can talk about how to figure out how many milkweeds were on the landscape back then. Fast forward to today, um, the landscapes we see today really don't have quite the diversity of milkweeds that the, the prairies did. Uh, in fact, most of the milkweeds that you will see are this species here, common milkweed, which is found in uh, waste areas. And uh, it's, a, it's a species of disturbance. So actually it, uh, it sort of thrived with, with agriculture because agriculture disturbs landscapes. And so you'd see um, milkweeds in old fields and, and other sorts of areas. And um, you would also find them uh, in corn and soybean fields. So um, what I want to do is, is kind of compare the milkweed support capacity back then before agriculture with the milkweed support capacity today, which would be mainly having to do with uh, 
common milkweed to to kind of make that extrapolation we have to um, add in some more information we can't just sort of figure out how many milkweeds there were in the past and how many milkweeds there are today we have to recognize that monarch butterflies in fact have preferences for certain milkweed species over others so uh, this is results of a story uh, uh, a study done by Tori Potius uh, in our department who who looked at the, the number of eggs laid by females on various uh, milkweed species. And I don't know what, how well you can see these things here, but you can see that uh, incarnata, that's the swamp milkweed, soriaca, that's the common milkweed. Those two just flip over here. But those are the two most preferred species. And, and then there are other ones that are not very preferred at all. So if we think about this landscape in the past with lots of diversity of milkweeds, we have to recognize, well, uh, the females may not have preferred all of those species. And we, so we have to kind of correct the amount of milkweed that's there by female preference for it. Um, another thing we need to do when we're moving forward to kind of compare the past with the present, we have to be aware that the milkweeds on the landscape today, or at least in the year 2000, which is when most of this stuff was done. We'll get to that in a minute. But if you go back to the early 2000s uh, and looked at the landscapes, you'd have found common milkweed across the landscape. But some of those milkweed stems were actually more preferred by females than others. And in fact, milkweeds that were growing in agricultural fields had almost four times as many eggs per stem as ones growing in roadsides or other areas. So what I want to do then is look at the past, look at all the milkweeds that were, that were there, factor in the fact that females prefer some over others, come to the present, look at landscapes today, which are mostly common milkweed, but also take into consideration the preference for milkweeds in agricultural fields. So here's, here's what we come up with. So, Somebody in, uh, John White, in fact, in, uh, a graduate student in what was the botany department uh, at one time here at Iowa State, surveyed a lot of remnant prairies in Iowa and nearby Nebraska, and looked at the percent cover of, of all species, including uh, milkweeds. And so these are the species of milkweeds that he uh, found, and, and these are their cover values. And this is the cumulative cover value. We can then fast forward here to 1999 uh, with a survey of milkweeds in Iowa by somebody in your department, Bob Hartzler. And this is the percent cover of common milkweed in Iowa compared to a uh, percent cover of milkweed before agriculture. Now, this number is, is lower than that number. However, we talked about the fact that some of these milkweeds are not as preferred as common milkweeds. So if we include that and include the fact that the, that the milkweeds in agricultural fields are more preferred, now we get to a number that's more like this compared to that. Whether these numbers are really different from each other or not, it's hard to say, but perhaps we can say that the milkweed support capacity, at least in 1999, wasn't too dissimilar to what, what the capacity was uh, before agriculture. Well, we can fast forward again to another survey that Bob did in 2009, and now the milkweed abundance in Iowa is, is much lower, and when we include overposition preference, it's still way lower. So the milkweed landscape today is, there's a lot less milkweed on the landscape today available to monarchs than there was back before the, the prairie was plowed. So we'll get into, into that in just a minute here. So, um, so that's just in terms of just the amount of milkweed on a landscape um, at different points in time. So sort of the next thing to hit um, monarchs having to do with agriculture were the GMOs. And 
this started in uh, 1996 when BT corn was developed and introduced. BT corn um, produces a, a toxin that was genetically altered to produce a toxin that would target particularly the European corn borer, um, but, and it, it targets all Lepidopteran species, which, of which uh, the monarch butterfly is one. So there was a study done by John Losey at uh, Cornell in 1999, where he, he said, well, what happens if, if corn pollen, Bt corn pollen, which also has this Bt toxin in it, what if that corn pollen gets on a milkweed leaf and then a monarch butterfly eats that milkweed leaf and gets this toxin, what'll happen to it? So, so in the lab anyway, he, he put a bunch of pollen on a milkweed leaf and, and the caterpillars didn't do very well. And so this raised a lot of concerns. And so in the year 2000, uh, a number of us here at Iowa State, including Bob Hartzler um, and at other universities, decided to go out and do some field and lab studies to see, you know, is this really a concern? So the concerns were raised by a lab study where you could put as much pollen on a leaf as you wanted, but what's it like out in the real world? So I won't go into, you know, a, a big discussion about this. I'll just give you the sort of the bottom line of, of this, which was that we really determined that BT corn had a pretty neg negligible effect on the monarch population. Um, for a variety of reasons. One, the, po the BT corn pollen wasn't out there during the entire uh, summer cycle for the monarch butterflies out there pretty, for a pretty limited period of time. And even though there are milkweeds in agricultural fields, the amount of pollen falling on those the leaves was really uh, too low to um, be a major concern for monarch butterfly caterpillars. So, our, our general conclusion was, no, this is, not, this is not a major issue for monarch butterflies. But there were some, some interesting things that we discovered in, in doing this study, which um, came to be very important uh, in, in looking at the, the next thing to come along. So based on, on, on Bob Hartzler's uh, calculations, we estimated about 40% of all milkweeds on the landscape were actually in corn and soybean fields, which is, which is a lot. We, we didn't really realize it was that much. And then when you factor in that uh, monarch butterflies prefer those milkweed stems, maybe four to one over other milkweeds, that tells you that there's a lot of monarch support capacity that's in agricultural fields. And so we estimated about 80% of all the monarch production in the Midwest actually comes from corn and soybean fields. So that was, that was a completely um, new finding. No one had any idea how important these fields were to, to monarch production. Well, so um, after we finished this BT corn study, um, most people stopped looking in fields and at, at monarchs and went on to other things, but I, I persisted and uh, kept looking at a number of fields in, in the Ames area and just looking at how much milkweed there was in these fields. And what I found was that the number just kept going down and going down. And by 2008, I couldn't find any more milkweeds in these fields. And at that point I called up Bob said, Bob, you need to go out and uh, do another major survey of, of fields and other areas to see if what I'm seeing is really true on a broader scale. And, and sure enough, the, compared to milkweed densities before, they were very, very low in fields at this point. So milkweeds were disappearing from agricultural fields. There's no question about it. And um, this was coincident with the adoption of all the Roundup Ready corn and soybeans or a glyphosate tolerant. So these were, were rolled out in, in 1996 and uh, very quickly adopted, particularly with uh, soybeans and then a little more slowly with corn. But by today, over 90% of all the corn and soybeans that you see growing out in the fields are glyphosate tolerant or Roundup Ready. So these fields are now, can be sprayed with glyphosate, which is a very potent 
herbicide and the rise and adoption of, of these uh, herbicide tolerant crops is coincident with the, the downfall of milkweeds in these fields. And this becomes pretty obvious if you start looking at some fields that have been sprayed with glyphosate. So here's the soybean field two days after spraying. Uh, we're already seeing some of the um, grass in between. This is a very dirty field. All the grass in between is kind of yellowing up. But here's some milkweed plants. So far, so good. They're looking okay. But eight days in, here they are. They're starting to look pretty yellow. And 18 days in, they're pretty much gone. So it turns out glyphosate is a very potent herbicide um, against milkweed. Some of the herbicides that were used before glyphosate was used on fields were not nearly as effective. So what have we got here? Well, we've got this finding from the year 2000 or so, which was that there was you know, about 80% of all monarch production was coming out of agricultural fields because of the milkweeds that are there. And now we're finding from that period on to middle 2005, six, seven, eight, all those milkweeds are disappearing. So it, it's fairly logical that that would have some effect on the, on the monarch population. And just to give an idea of what the, the landscape you know, looks like for, for monarch butterflies uh, then and now, In 1999, uh, Bob estimated about 50% of corn and soybean fields had milkweeds. By 2015, that was virtually zero. So Ames is in here someplace, um, but imagine this to be, you know, the landscape that a, a monarch butterfly is flying through, female looking from, for milkweeds to lay eggs. And um, all the yellow that you see, those are fields with milkweeds and the orange are ones without. So she would have had a pretty easy time of, of finding milkweeds in this landscape. But by 2015, virtually all those milkweeds were gone from fields. Now it doesn't mean that there were, it's a complete desert. All the little crisscross things that you see there are, are roads and there's still a lot of milkweeds in roads. But obviously it's a lot more difficult to find milkweeds now than it was back then. So how did this affect the monarch population? Well, over here on the left, I've, I've sort of calculated the monarch support capacity, if you will, the amount of milkweeds that, that are out there um, since about 1999. And you can see the numbers gone down. That's what's happened in the fields. And then it's remained at a fairly low level or a fairly steady level, I should say, still declining a little bit, then these would be the milkweeds that are outside of cornfields. If you compare that to what we see on the overwintering grounds, you can see that the, the main period of decline for the monarch butterfly was really in the same period when the milkweeds were going down. And since that point, actually, there's no uh, statistically significant decline. It sort of stayed it's not really steady, but on average, it's about, about three hectares. Um, so I, I think this is pretty good evidence that you know, the habitat loss, which is fairly typical for, for species, habitat loss contributing to population decline. Um, I made some calculations about just how many milkweed stems were present at different points in time. So in, in uh, 1999, 4. Point billion. Now, or at least 2014, 1.3. So 3.3 billion stems lost from from corn and soybean fields. That's that's quite a bit. So, in terms of monarch conservation, one of the the, the key things that people are focusing on is getting milkweeds back on the landscape. Try, trying to sort of put back at least some of the milkweeds that were extirpated from corn and soybean fields. My, myself and some colleagues have done some um, modeling of the size of the population in Mexico and imagining 
the population going up and down and throwing in the possibility of winter storms. And we've come up with this idea that about, if on average there's about six hectares of butterflies in Mexico, then the chances of the population going extinct are, are fairly low. So what you need is you need a milkweed support capacity that'll give you on average at least uh, six hectares in Mexico. And so I, I won't go through the details of this, but you can do some extrapolations to find out, well, how many more milkweeds do we need to put out there to get to that point? Turns out it's about 1.6 billion milkweed stems. So for conservation, for conservation purposes, that, that is uh, the goal. Uh, how do you do that? Well, I, I won't go into uh, the details on uh, this particular slide, but myself and some other colleagues have tried to figure out, well, there's a bunch of available land where we could put milkweeds. We can think about um, the extent to which those particular kinds of lands might get milkweeds. And so how much milkweed would we need from each of these, these sectors here to get to our six hectare goal? And again, without going into details, what we came up with this this idea of all hands on deck. You really have to you have to get more milkweeds in all of these sectors to to get to the goal. And agriculture uh, plays a, an important role, not crop production fields, but uh, we're targeting sort of marginal crop fields where uh, you could you can in fact perhaps not grow crops there anymore, but put in prairie or something like that instead. One of the things we have here at Iowa State is this Iowa Monarch Conservation Consortium. So this got started in 2015, looking at, at uh, monarch conservation. And we now have 53 members and partners. And these members and partners include all, all the stakeholders in this. So it, it, it includes farmers and soybean producers and uh, uh, agrochemical people and so on. And the idea is to get these groups together to talk about how we can get more milkweeds on the landscape. And um, we've actually put together a plan for Iowa, uh, trying to figure out how many milkweeds we need to contribute. So what, what's the contribution that Iowa needs to make to this 1.6 billion stems and how are we gonna get there? Um, so there, a number of um, habitats that could be targeted for milkweed augmentation. Um, as I mentioned, marginal cropland where you know, a farmer doesn't make profit except fairly rarely, um, those could be converted to some kind of um, habitat that would be good, not just for monarchs, but for pollinators as well. We've got rights of way, roadways and so on, another big habitat area that could be utilized. CRP land that already exists. Um, CRP land comes in a lot of varieties. One is a pollinator habitat variety. And they're protected grasslands that could also be targeted. These are might be ones that are owned by the state or the federal government. So um, when we think about some of these uh, habitat areas. One that I mentioned was roadsides. Uh, there are about 11.3 million acres uh, in the Midwest that are in mode roadsides. 32% of all milkweeds are in the Midwest actually are currently in roadsides. And, but 42% of roadside transects in Iowa and Minnesota had no milkweed. So here's a, here's a habitat that's sort of ripe for milkweed augmentation. It's also sort of an easy habitat type to deal with in that you just have to get roadside managers on board with, with putting, putting milkweeds there, as opposed to if you're gonna use marginal cropland, you've gotta get buy-in by farmers and so on. Um, so one thing that comes up though, is that if we're putting uh, milkweeds along roadsides, we know that those roadsides are by and large along agricultural fields. So 
what happens when insecticides are applied to those fields? How is that going to affect the milkweeds that are in these roadsides? So I'm not going to go into a lot of uh, detail on this. Uh, Naranjana in the entomology department has been doing a lot of work on this, and I'm going to be talking, just sort of summarizing a little bit of the work that she's done. Um, so here are some of the common chemicals that could be applied to fields. Some of these are uh, foliar chemicals, so they're sprayed on, on the plants themselves. Some of these are seed treatments, and there's the whole class of these things called neonics, um, used fairly commonly for seed treatments. So um, what happens if some of these chemicals get out of fields to neighboring areas, roadsides, what have you, and what if monarch butterflies encounter some of these chemicals? So Naranjan has been doing a lot of work just looking at various doses of these chemicals, uh, uh, putting them on leaves, having butterflies, caterpillars feed on them just to see what the dose response is. And um, there's, there are clearly very different kinds of um, systems here. I mentioned the foliar insecticides. That's going to be uh, a system where the caterpillar is either, either the insecticides are falling on its body and it's affecting it that way, or it's falling on a leaf that it then eats. The, the seed treatments, uh, typically these are, the seeds are coated with say neonix and in the, in the planting process, some of this, this dust sort of comes off, which it can then get into the air and get on, on, on leaves. And so those are a couple of ways that these things could get into uh, monarch butterflies. So one of the things that you need to look at here to try to figure out what might be the effect of these chemicals is to put it in the context of what the phenology of monarch butterflies is. So I mentioned that uh, this red line here sort of indicates the population of monarch butterflies through the summer. And as I said, they kind of come here in, in mid-May mid they're sort of, this is sort of the first generation and then the offspring there lay eggs and that's now we've got the second generation. A lot of the seed treatment things happen um, well before monarch butterflies actually appear and so are, are less likely to have an impact. But there are some things that can happen in right in the peak of the population for monarchs such as uh, spraying for soybean aphids. And so uh, this is something to, to at least be concerned about. So, oh, here's, here's Naranjana. Uh, this is a paper she has in environmental toxicology and, and toxicology and chemistry. And I'll, I'll just kind of summarize some of her conclusions without going into a lot of detail. Um, so she tested all life stages, you know, starting from the tiniest little caterpillars all the way up to bigger caterpillars, you know, depending on when the exposure occurred, and then sort of ranked the toxicity of the various chemicals. Her conclusions were that uh, seed treatments really didn't pose uh, much of a risk to monarchs, mostly because of a timing thing. It's the foliar insecticides that uh, pose a greater risk and, and can cause uh, fairly high mortality off of fields to really figure out what the implications for this might be, need to sort of do a landscape analysis. So if we think that some insecticide drift off of fields can get to the milkweeds next to those fields and affect monarchs negatively, should that deter us from planting milkweeds along roadsides? So here you are. Slides, please. Pardon? Can you make the slides large, please? This is as that's that's as large as I've got them. Is, is that is that too small for you? Somehow it switched that the large view was you. 
maybe it's just my iPad, but if anybody okay. else. Okay. Um, so, so the question is, well, should we be planting milkweeds along roadsides? Are we just uh, luring uh, butterflies to their doom? Um, so she started doing some, some landscape scale analyses, which involve um, using programs to, to tell you just how much drift might come off of fields under different conditions, and then how much insecticide there might be on milkweed plants next to those fields, and then based on her lab studies, what effect that might have on monarch butterflies. Um, that analysis isn't completed, but generally what it appears is if, yes, there might be some monarch mortality that occurs because milkweeds are growing next to an agricultural field where some foliar insecticide has been applied, but you know, the, the net benefit to monarchs by having those additional milkweeds along that, in, in that habitat, uh, far outweigh the costs in terms of some, some butterflies dying. So um, if you wanna hear more about that part of things, um, Naranjan is gonna give you a seminar uh, in the entomology department. So you can, you can check that out. And um, I haven't been coming into the office that much recently, but if I'm there and my car is parked behind Bessie Hall, you'll know that I'm there. That's my license plate. So thanks for your attention. If you've got some questions, I'll be happy to see what I can do. All right, any question to Dr. Pleasant? Thank you, Dr. Pleasant. That was a great presentation and a very interesting topic. We appreciated it. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, several years ago, um, six or seven years ago, um, the conversation came up about monarchs and the decline. And uh, a man I was talking to mentioned that, well, he was kind of arguing against the idea that glyphosate was the major cause of decline because he said, he, he pointed out that um, there was also um, a correlation with GPS being used by farmers for precision planting, which allowed them to use some of the borders as opposed to having borders just to define where the edges of their fields were. And, you know, I'm sure your, you know, your results um, came out after this conversation. And so he you know, wasn't probably as informed as he could have been about the science behind the populations and glyphosate and so forth. But so what, what could you talk, what do you know about um, GPS being a factor and just more of the fields actually being planted as opposed to borders. And yeah, how it affects so, what, so his point, I guess, was that uh, it, that uh, because the, the field borders could now be planted successfully, uh, you're, you're going to lose some, some milkweeds that hang around on the borders of, of fields. Um, so, yeah, I think his perception was that the, most of the milkweed was in the borders, not in yeah. the fields. Well, and I think, you know, in, back in 2000, when we started looking at the BT corn issue, um, we really had no idea there was that much milkweed actually in the fields. Now, you know, if we talked to a farmer, I'm, I'm sure the farmer probably could have told us that or talked to teenage kids who had to go out and, and pull milkweeds from fields for, for their <laughs> summer, for their summer job. But, you know, us in the scientific community didn't really realize there was that much milkweed out there. But yeah, uh -huh. the milkweed was actually in the fields. And one of the things uh, to know about milkweeds, you know, unlike a lot of the weeds that are in fields, most of the weeds that you see in fields are annuals. So they have to grow, they have to make a seed, and then the seed gives you a, a weed again the next year. But milkweeds are perennials. So um, they can persist for, for years, as long as there's, you know, a little um, bit of a rhizome there, they can put up another, another stem and keep going. And it's, it's, it's possible that some of these 
um, little clones of milkweeds that, you, that we used to see in fields anyway, because you, you tend to see these things in patches. And if you know anything about common milkweed, if you said, I'm going to help monarchs and I'm going to grow common milkweed in, in the garden at my house, they spread all over the place. So I, I've got some that have gone from one side of my driveway to the other. So they, uh, they have a lot, they have very strong vegetative reproduction. And so what happens is if you've got a, a clump of milkweeds in the field and, you know, before the herbicide days, the, the farmer would come through and till it all up. And basically what he or she was doing was uh, chopping up all the pieces of rhizome and spreading them around and then milkweeds would pop up again the next year. So there's, the point is there's a lot more, there at least was a lot more milkweed in fields, certainly than on the edges of fields. There's still milkweed on the edges of fields though. Thank you. That kind of ties in with the question we have in the group chat um, that you have milkweed in your house, but what about urban planting of milkweed? Um, Sally says there's a lot of round where she lives. <laughs> Yeah, so um, so I've said, you know, we need 1.6 billion stems. Um, and when you think about that, you can think about urban plantings. Um, we're not talking about a lot of acreage there. And so we're not talking about, you know, really potential for getting close to that 1.6 billion stems. We've got a lot more potential if we're thinking about roadsides or marginal crop land or CRP land and so on. But, but that doesn't mean what people grow in their gardens can't be useful. So one of the things that um, I, I hear people say, because basically the case that I've been making here is that milkweeds are a limiting resource for monarch butterflies. And when we remove a huge amount of it from the landscape, uh, the population suffers. But they'll tell me, I, you know, I'm, I drive around, you know, the roads here in I or wherever they are, there's milkweed everywhere. How, how can milkweeds be a limiting resource for, for monarch butterflies? I, I mean, I see it everywhere. And any, anybody here who's done any field work, I'm sure you've seen it, seems like everywhere. And it's not like it's eaten to the ground. Uh, so there's not that many monarchs to just completely defoliate it. So to, to understand how milkweeds might be limiting, you kind of need to know something about the behavior of female monarchs who are laying eggs. So if you've got milkweeds in your garden or wherever, if you're watching them, a female will come in and it could be a patch of 10 stems, could be a patch of 100 stems. She'll lay one or two eggs and then she'll move on. It's not like if there's a hundred stems, she just sits there for a while and lays tens of eggs. That's, that's their behavior. They lay a few eggs and then they have to go on to find the next patch. And so what's critical then is that there is some next patch for them to find. And this is where I think these urban milkweeds can be important. They can be little stepping stones to sort of bigger patches that might be around. So again, that, that picture that I showed you of this landscape sort of devoid of, of milkweeds. If we put in little dots in there, which is, you know, urban plantings, uh, that can sort of provide a pathway for, for females to at f find various areas to, to, to lay their eggs. Thank you. Um, another question in our chat um, from Laura. You discussed the monarchs migration. Do they have, do they have, they have preferred migration routes and have they changed over time? Um, kind of goes back to what you're saying, if we're putting in those little points, have you noticed a difference? Yeah, so uh, during migration, of course, um, milkweed doesn't make any difference at all. They're, they're, they're finished with that. So during migration, what, what they need are nectar sources. So if somebody wants to do something uh, locally in their garden to help out monarchs, uh, milkweeds during the summer breeding season, that's what you need. And now during the fall, you need some things that are blooming in the fall to provide uh, nectar sources for them as they're traveling to Mexico. There are two main flyways to Mexico. One's called the Central Flyway, which comes down here through Iowa and goes down uh, near, near Texas, uh, 
And uh, then there's the Eastern Flyway. So butterflies who grow up in the summertime in say New York and Connecticut and places like that, they actually go down, uh, you've got the Appalachian Mountains. So here's Iowa on this side and here's the other side and here's the, the Atlantic coast. They go down uh, along the Appalachian Mountains and then cut over to get in to go to Mexico. So they're sort of two different, two different flyways. Thank you. Another question. Can you speak to habitat destruction in Mexico as a limiting factor in population support? Yeah, so, you know, when the, the population decline was first noticed in Mexico, one of the, um, one of the lenses was, was put on just the overwintering sites. So it, it was very clear, um, you know, in the early 2000s that there was a lot of illegal logging in these overwintering sites. People were coming in and cutting down these, these fir trees. And initially, um, it was thought that that might be the major thing that was causing the population to climb. Um, but the Mexican government, everybody got sort of interested in monarch butterflies and monarch butterfly conservation. And the Mexican government kind of came down uh, harder on illegal logging. And it's, it's still going on at some level, but a much lower level uh, than it was before. So it, it's possible that some logging has affected the, the size of the population, how much can actually overwinter, how much overwintering habitat there is. Um, but it's probably not the main factor. Okay. Anyone has any more questions? You can have them in the chat. I had a quick question for you, because um, you talked about using like marginal land and CRP. Um, what's been the reaction you've had from farmers? I know you talked about having the monarch conservation program. Um, has it overall been positive and people willing to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, I can't say that I, you know, I have talked to hundreds of farmers and, and really know exactly what's going on. But, but it's clear that um, there, you know, there's an interest in, um, in preserving the monarchs. And, uh, and, and I think a lot, of, a lot of farmers are getting on board with doing something with uh, little pieces of land that they have that are kind of here and there. And they just have to go out and mow them every year. And well, why not put them in some kind of habitat that they don't have to mow? and it might be beneficial in some way to, to monarchs and, and pollinators in general. I noticed somebody put in the chat, now why do they prefer um, milkweeds in agricultural fields? And that's a good, that's a good question. Um, there, there are several possibilities. Uh, one, I've looked at the nitrogen content of milkweed leaves um, of plants growing in fields and out of fields, and the nitrogen content's higher. Nitrogen's important to to monarch butterfly caterpillars. The other thing that I think is, is part of it is that um, the monarchs as they're flying through, through the environment are trying to find milkweed plants. They're using the volatile chemicals that come off milkweed plants to sort of track these things and to figure out where they are. And if you've watched monarch butterflies coming into your garden, if you have a fairly diverse garden with some milkweeds and other kinds of things, you can see that they they're kind of hunting for the milkweed plants. I mean, it's just imagine a, a, a chemical environment. They are attuned to milkweed chemicals, but it's a, it's a very diverse chemical environment that they're coming into when they come into your garden. But now think about a cornfield or a soybean field that's corn and maybe has patches of milkweed in it, okay? Those little patches of milkweed are like beacons for these butterflies, and I think they one of the reasons that they prefer them is that they just, they're, they're easy to find. And when they get there, they lay their eggs and another monarch comes along and lays her eggs there too. So I think that's, that's probably one of the factors. Another one is, particularly in cornfields, milkweed leaves kind of vary in how tough they are. And so milkweeds that are growing out in the open, those leaves tend to be kind of tough, but milkweeds that are growing in the shade are much thinner and those the those are the ones that the caterpillars really thrive on. And so uh, that may be another reason why the ones in fields are more preferred. Thank you for that. 
there's another. <laughs> Anyone trying to breed ra Roundup Ready Milkweed? Yep, I, <laughs> I, get, I get that question. Um, no, I think, <laughs> no, no one's trying. I think farmers would be, would be up in arms if you tried to create a, a, a Roundup Ready Milkweed plant. Okay. My question is, do they, do the, it prevent if a one monarch lays egg on a milkweed and then another won't lay egg on the same plant or they can do, they can lay eggs on the same plant, like multiple monarchs? Uh, they, they, they can lay eggs on the same plant. Um, they, um, there, there isn't any indication that they really avoid a leaf that already has an egg on it. Um, I mean, they, they're very attuned to chemical cues and things, but we don't really have any evidence that they avoid a leaf that's already got an egg on it. Generally speaking, you know, except under very rare circumstances, you don't really find multiple eggs on leaves, but that's because you don't find that many eggs on any, any individual plant. And we had a comment from um, Dr. Emily Heaton. Thanks, super interesting and easy to understand. Great data and visuals. Okay. Uh, nice. And we are running um, just two on the dot. So um, just a reminder to everyone still on the call that next week we have Dr. Prashant Jha uh, with his presentation, Scaling Up Sustainable Integrated Weed Management Solutions in Midwest Corn and Soybean Production. So I wanted to thank everyone on the call. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Pleasant.